Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about polymers and nanomaterials, ending our discussion on the different types of solids there are. If you missed the other types of solids, go back and watch the video on metallic solids, where we did a lot of molecular orbital theory and band structure, and then the other video on ionic, covalent, and molecular solids. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about polymers and nanomaterials. And these are the two newest forms of solids, I, I suppose, uh, polymers being the first. And these are really molecules of high molecular weight made by joining smaller molecules together. Okay, and these smaller molecules are monomers. So the real, you know, distinct point of a polymer is it's a really long molecule, right? You can imagine small molecules, maybe it's benzene, can stack on top of another benzene, and this is all nice and uniform. And you could have a stack of, say, benzene molecules. Or this is graphite, where each layer is graphene. Overall, it's graphite, and this solid grows like so. But what happens if each one of these layers is not just a simple short molecule, but this really long, thin molecule? Well, it's really hard for the molecule to stay flat for so long. It ends up curling around and you know, kinetic motion will be such and random that this is the long molecule shape now, right? So this is characteristic of hydrocarbon chains that get really, really long. And so this is a polymer that is this repetitive unit, oftentimes of carbon, although you can have oxygen, nitrogen, and, you know, sulfur mixed in as well. Um, but sort of the prototypical ones are very long chains of carbon that are so long, you know, they sort of hop back over one another, this one's going over now, and creating some really long type of curled structure, right? That's a polymer, and it's going to have many different properties than, say, a covalent network solid of just carbons, like diamond, uh, or a molecular solid like graphite, which is also carbon, but these long chains of carbon become a polymer. And it's really high molecular weight, and that's what I mean by really long mo molecule. But oftentimes it's actually synthesized in the laboratory, starting with some monomer unit. So mono meaning single, you can think of just like polyethylene. So here's polyethylene, two carbons with a double bond, and then you have these two hydrogens. Now, what happens if I get another polyethylene close? And I'll just draw it slightly differently, and you'll see why in a second. If I get these two polyethylenes close, and I supply a little bit of heat, you know, maybe I can move this double bond here and form a new bond between the two different polyethylenes. That is these two monomers that have now formed a dimer. And this could be moved over here to connect to another polyethylene whose double bond could move to another polyethylene. And so you could have a whole bunch of repeating monomers. And at the beginning, here is two of them. That would be a dimer. Well, if you have a whole bunch of them, poly many, you can have a whole bunch of these mers or molecules uh, to come together to make this really long unit. And so these polymers are made by a lot of times just heating these individual groups of molecules, small molecules like monomers, polyethylene like I drew, uh, drawn here, becoming this uh, you know polyethylene molecule from the base ethylene units is one example of a polymer. So these molecules aren't straight, so a lot of the shape dictates their properties. The longer the chain, the more of these twists and turns, right, in the structure happen. And that's just due to sort of kinetic motion and the floppiness that these bonds aren't super rigid. There is some movement to them. Now, often what happens is it's hard to control exactly how long this polymer chain gets. And so when you're synthesizing these, you might have, this is nine, you might have nine units together in this length, right? And you might have five, 10, 12 units together in this length. And you might have five, 10, 15, 17 or so units in this length. And so altogether, this is still a single, you know, 
polymer or polymeric solid, uh, but it's made up of different lengths of these polymers, right? This is a nine unit, this is a 12 unit, this is a 17 unit, but altogether here, this is still, you know, polyethylene polymers grouped together where the chains have a variety of different lengths. Okay, so now you're a mixture of different exact molecular weights, but all together, how these lay across each other, how they, you know, uh, have kinks in them, all these structural differences than you would have in something much smaller, like, you know, uh, graphenes laying on top of each other and making this graphite structure where it's nice, neat, and orderly. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different structural characteristics here that make it different from a conventional molecular solid. Uh, and we have this new term for these types of solids called polymers. Usually, although not always, uh, this material is going to be pretty flexible. Um, and the reason is, you know, a lot of the linkages here are uh, van der Waals type forces, really weak, easy to overcome. So when you push on these things, you know, you can move them around, but you can straighten out the kinks. You're not usually going to break the chemical bond, the carbon carbon bond here, but, you know, if you tug on this carbon this way and this carbon this way think of it like a piece of string right or spaghetti and this is your bowl of spaghetti here you're able to pull on the ends and straighten this out so it's possible that this group right pulled out becomes flat if you supply it some energy and so these things tend to be flexible there is some movement here that is a characteristic property of a polymer now Polymer chemists have gotten quite good at changing the physical properties of individual polymers. And one of the things that I think is important to bring up is this concept of vulcanization, right? Where you can introduce chemical bonds. So you have this big group of spaghetti, right? This thing is, you know, wound on itself and, and curled around, like I'm showing here. And then you can add in other atoms and add some energy. And if you can cross-link these and create a really strong chemical bond, whereas before you would just have something like dispersion forces or maybe dipole-dipole forces like van der Waals forces, Right? These are very weak. These are very strong. And so what you can do is take this, you know, pile of noodles, that is your polymer, and heat with some other atoms to enable these chemical bonds to form that chemically bond, these cross links together. And now you've strengthened this polymer overall. And this is what vulcanization is when you heat these chains with sulfur atoms you make this rubber, which is a polymer of itself, much, much stronger. And so, you know, vulcanization is an example here of how you can change the property of this polymer, right, by doing some uh, chemistry on it. And so there's a lot of different types of uh, things you can do to polymers, whether it's adding uh, different, you know, doping atoms or different kinds of uh, monomers uh, into your polymer mixture to change the property, or something more chemical like vulcanization. Uh, these things are quite tunable, which is really going to be a theme for today's lecture, because polymers and nanomaterials are, are very tunable, and so they find a, a large, um, uh, there's a lot of applications of these things because they have a lot of properties that are easy to change to fit your needs. So that's polymers. Nanomaterials are kind of different than all the other types of solids we talked about, and nanomaterials is really the newest form of a solid, but Really, it just has to do with the particle dimension. And ever since we really stumbled across uh, quantum mechanics in the early 1900s, right, we realized that matter behaves much differently when you get it really, really small. So once you get it to the nanoscale, right, 10 to the negative 9 meters or so, and really over the size range of about 1 nanometer to maybe 100 nanometers, okay, this size regime, you see a lot of manifestations of quantum mechanics. And so the matter behaves differently, so the properties you get out at the end are quite different. And this graphic on the right here is just giving you some scale of what this size regime is really like. It's on the order of, say, uh, 
uh, DNA or hemoglobin, right, or a glucose molecule, maybe all the way up to the size of a virus, but these things are really, really tiny, right, compared to uh, something like an ant that is 10 to the 6 nanometers, right? This is 10 to the 1 nanometer. So an ant is five orders of magnitude bigger than a DNA. And so you're talking about structures here, whether it's a buckyball like fullerene or a carbon nanotube, these things that are maybe 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, uh, where quantum mechanics still dictates a lot of their properties. Semiconductors that we talked about in the previous lecture, if you get them small enough, right? Semiconductors are these things where we can dope uh, silicon, for example, to change its electronic properties. But if we take these doped semiconductors, right, or just pure semiconductors and shrink them down to the nanoscale, their properties change. So just by changing the size, you see uh, here in the top of the figure, we're going from two nanometers to 4.2 nanometers. All we're changing is the size of the particle and the color that we see changes, right? And this goes back to our molecular orbital theory, right? We, we talked about in the case of lithium, we talked about it in the case of carbon, uh, the, these other types of uh, solids, that the electronic structure, which eventually evolves into bands and solids, and you can have a valence band and a conduction band separated by some band gap. The size of this band gap dictates whether it's an insulator, a semiconductor, or a conductor. Metals are conductors. A lot of covalent network solids like diamonds are uh, insulators. Now, with a semiconductor, you're adding some extra molecular orbitals in here. Okay? But not only that, if you change the size, you're not maybe at this big solid network band theory where all the molecular orbitals, there's so many molecular orbitals here because there's so many atoms that you get these bands. Imagine we walk back to just two silicon atoms. Here's a silicon and here's a silicon. Their atomic orbitals make a bonding, uh, sorry, anti-bonding and bonding molecular orbital. That's for two silicons. You can go back and watch our molecular orbital theory lecture for more information. But as you build this from two uh, to four states, right, to eight states, to bands, the electronic structure and the number of these levels and their spacing is changing. So all we're doing here is taking these semiconductors, right, and changing their size, which means we're changing the gap here between these molecular orbitals. Eventually, as we get enough atoms and enough molecular orbitals, these things form bands and you have a band gap, but on the nanometer size regime, right, where you're talking about 10 to 100 atoms, you're not yet at this band structure, so you aren't really a huge solid. You're this tiny size where you still have these discrete states, not a continuous amount of places where the electrons go. Right? This band structure is essentially all the places an electron can go, and they're so, spacely, so closely spaced together, we call it a continuous band of states, not discrete separated states. But in this small size regime, we're not yet at the band structure. We're still in this definitive gap. And so this gap is getting you know, uh, bigger or smaller uh, depending on the size of these. So when it's small, the band gap is larger. Uh, the color then the wavelength uh, necessary is different than uh, when the particles are large. So uh, this, you know, was first really uh, discovered quite easily in these cadmium uh, solenoid types of uh, semiconductor particles, and they ended up being called quantum dots. So that's sort of your prototypical example of uh, semiconductors shrinking down to the nanoscale and really seeing the manifestation of this quantum behavior um, really quite beautifully, as you change the size of these cadmium selenide particles, uh, you get this really beautiful different colors just based on the physical size. Is it 10 atoms? Is it 20? Is it 100? Uh, that are grouped together in these particles. Now, uh, some other types of species at the nanoscale. Here's a semiconductor, right? Here is a metal. 
So these metal particles we talked about before and this metallic metallic bonding that is inherent to things like, you know, sodium, titanium, you know, chromium, lead, uh, iron, right? These are typical metals we think of, right? We know they're strong. Uh, we know they have this silver shiny uh, appearance, but here's the really fascinating part. When you take this, maybe think of gold. Why do we value gold? We value gold, well, because it's nice and shiny, but we also value it because it doesn't really react with things. We call this a noble metal, right? It doesn't uh, oxidize, right? Like iron, it doesn't rust. It lasts a, a good long time. But this is a huge, right, gold bar, very macroscopic. What happens if I cut this gold in half and then cut it in half again? and then a half again, and a half again, and I keep cutting in half until I don't have a gold bar, but instead I have like 50 gold atoms together. What's crazy is that once you get down to this small size regime of say 10 gold atoms or 20 gold atoms, gold doesn't look gold anymore. It looks pink. It looks more yellowish, right? It looks greener. And so you can actually get gold not to be gold colored by going down to the nanometer size regime. And you're really affecting both the reactivity of gold, it gets super reactive, and the color of gold because you are at the nanometer size regime. And this is still related to this, right, definitive molecular orbital diagram and not a band theory. So, you know, the, the take home here is that when you approach this nanoscale, right, maybe one to 100 nanometers, you're talking 10 to 100 types of atoms, the properties are different. The color of gold is no longer gold. It reacts like crazy. It's good for catalysis. It's not this inert thing we want to uh, use as part of our money. Um, so metals on the nanoscale behave quite differently. Um, in fact, stained glass is a common example of this, that Glass usually is silicon oxide, but if you have a couple particles of, say, uh, lead, right, or a couple particles of gold, or a couple particles of chromium, right, these finely divided metals, where there's only maybe 10 to 20 atoms grouped together, right, you start to get these beautiful colors. And so that's what stained glass really is, is these little uh, nanoscale metal particles suspended in glass. That's how we have stained glass right? It's not like silicon and oxide only, but it's these other gold or chromium or lead particles that get trapped in there and give us that nice green or blue or red hue uh, to this glass. So that's metallic solids on the nanoscale. We talked about uh, semiconductors on the nanoscale. What about just carbon, right? Carbon is, you know, fascinating material because as we talked about before, you can either have uh, a covalent network solid like diamond or you can have a molecular solid like graphite. And I don't know if, right, you could think of two <laughs> more different materials than graphite, where you are using a pencil and, and tearing this, you know, uh, tearing these layers of graphite off one by one, right? So this is a, a graphite here. These uh, layers that you're sliding off your pencil one by one onto a page, right? Your human force is plenty to overcome these dispersion forces that are attracting each layer to the next layer. But those are really weak uh, and you're really strong, so you overcome that force and break this graphite layer off and put it down on the piece of paper. And then you put the next one down and the next one as you draw. Right? So that's graphite, a bunch of carbons, very loosely held together by these intermolecular forces, dispersion forces. But then you have diamond which is not this soft material at all, but this super hard, the hardest material basically known to man. So carbon we already are familiar with. You know, we have this uh, really uh, soft material that we can use in pencils, or we have this really beautiful, uh, really hard material, diamond. Well, both graphite and diamond are just carbon, but it turns out once you get down to the nanoscale, you get new forms of carbon. And so you can roll these things into tube shapes. We call those carbon nanotubes, right? Carbon doesn't behave like graphite, right? It's not soft. Um, it's not insulating like diamond. Uh, it can have semiconducting properties and be quite metallic in nature. And you can form these things into tubes or wires that are super strong 
and have semiconducting properties. You can, uh, of course, isolate a single sheet of graphite. And people won the Nobel Prize for doing exactly this, because if you get rid of these sheets and are able to isolate a single sheet of this stacked graphite layer, uh, this is known as graphene and has many different properties than graphite. Or you can get these little C60 molecules known as buckyballs that are clusters of 60 carbon atoms. And each of these, whether it's a nanotube, a buckyball, a graphene sheet, each of these have unique properties that are very different from either diamond or graphite, our prototypical sort of carbon type materials. So, sometimes in these lectures, we pause for uh, practice problems, and that's what we're gonna do here, and, and try to figure out, try to test uh, your wits and your comprehension here, and see if you can answer uh, this question, right? about the difference between graphene and graphite. Were you paying attention? Take 20 seconds or so and think about it. What is the difference between graphene and graphite? Maybe 10 more seconds to think about this. Okay, so let's sort of think out loud, graphene versus graphite. Uh, graphite, I like to use the analogy of a ream of paper. Okay, so if you have 500 sheets of paper, like a package of, of paper you're going to load into your printer or something, right, they come in reams, and each page, right, there's 500 individual pieces of paper, paper, but they're all stacked together, okay? In this scenario, or this uh, analogy, the ream, the 500 pages together, okay, is graphite, all of that together. And when you push some force on the top of the ream, you can slide off this top page really easy, right? Just like with a pencil, you can slide off the top page of your graphite layer. Graphene is a singular one of these sheets, okay? So not a stack, but just a single sheet of carbon atoms, whereas graphite contains the layered sheets of carbon atoms. So the answer here should be A. Uh, it doesn't really have to do as much as the hybridization. Um, because, well, graph, well, they aren't sp3, um, but the electronic properties are affected by hybridization, it's just B is not correct here. Uh, graphite uh, and graphene are both pure carbon, there's not another atom in there, it is just carbon. Uh, and graphene uh, is an insulator, graphite is a metal. Uh, no, that one's not true. Um, you can actually tune uh, graphene quite a bit with doping atoms to change the conductive properties of it, uh, but it's usually actually a pretty good conductor. So that'll do it for this lecture where we covered nanomaterials and polymers, closing out our lectures on solid materials. So if you missed any of this, you can go back and watch the lectures on metallic solids, ionic solids, covalent network solids, molecular solids, polymers, or nanomaterials. Those six things together sort of summarize all the different types of solids we might come across in the natural world. So. That'll do it for this lecture. See you next time.